Okay, welcome everyone to week three of the ABCD Repronym course on reproducible neuroimaging practices. Uh, we are delighted today to be joined by our lecturers from this week. Uh, first up, we have Hugh Garavan from University of Vermont. Say hi, Hugh, and say a couple words about yourself. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, Hugh Garavan from the University of Vermont, the Department of Psychiatry. I'm both a, one of the co-PIs at the University of Vermont side, and I'm also an associate director on the study. So I guess I'm sort of involved in the design and the, the overview and monitoring and general dog's body tasks that the study produces. Great to be here. Yeah. Great. Thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, and the lecture that you have or will have seen uh, has to do with the ABCD sampling, recruitment, retention uh, materials. And we also have returning with us uh, Dorota Dreka from MIT. Say hello, Dorota. Hello, my name is Dorota. I'm still working at MIT and I'm still part of the Reponim uh, team. And yeah, I'm working mostly on software development. And the um, lectures that you all have hopefully seen or will see uh, that Dorota gives this week is on containers and the repro environment or uh, neuro docker type of ways of con creating containers. So I will turn uh, the mic over to Angie for some additional hellos. Hey everybody, Angie Laird again. Um, welcome to week three. We're excited to have you with us and we hope that you enjoyed both you and Dorota's lectures for this week. Um, we want to make a quick apology for, uh, we sent out the week three quiz in the email that was sent um, by Jessica on Friday, but we didn't actually, we kind of forgot, it slipped through the cracks to post it onto the website. So we fixed that this morning, um, thanks to the, the uh, reminders on that on Neurostart to get that done. And we put, put in a couple additional checks so that that won't happen again. Um, but for enrolled students, uh, again, all your quizzes are on Canvas and observe for students, you'll be getting things from the website that'll take you to the Google form. Um, uh, the additional announcement that I wanted to make is that next week we will hold our week four Q&A, uh, standard time, 1 p.m. EST, 10 a.m. PST, um, but we're going to go for an hour and a half next week because we're going to finish up with an additional 30 minutes because the folks from the NDA, the uh, NMH did archive, are going to be available to ask additional questions that are ENDA related, related to ABCD data access, either the process of getting access, um, terms and conditions for the doc, uh, things that you need to know to interact with ENDA. They're gonna be able to be here to answer your questions directly. So we'll make sure in the week four Q&A Google doc where you place your questions that we'll have a little separate spot at the end of that just for those questions with ENDA. Um, so again, it'll be 90 weeks, 90 minutes next week instead of 60 minutes, and everything will continue to be recorded and put on the website afterwards. Uh, with that, I want to go ahead and introduce this week's TA. Today we have James Kent available. James, would you like to say hi to everybody and introduce yourself? Hi everyone, I'm James. I'm a postdoctoral researcher that in Austin, Texas, working with Dr. Talia Arconi. Uh, just started in September, so I am relatively new in my position, but I am uh, working on things related to meta-analyses and other software-related uh, things in Python uh, within my work with Tal. So uh, I have learned a lot about the reproduction side of things, and I am learning a lot more about the ABCD side of things as well uh, during this course. So happy to meet you all and happy to take all your questions. Cool. Thank you, James. Um, I'm just going to jump on here. My name's Jessica. I'm the um, ABCD Reprogram course coordinator here. And I just want to jump in and do some uh, quick general course announcements before we go into the questions. Um, I just want to um, direct your attention over to the week three materials page. Like Angie said, uh, the quiz for week three, that's this week is now up there. Sorry that it didn't get put up there earlier. Um, but if you uh, are an observer student and you haven't already taken that quiz, please go to the week three materials page and make sure you do that. Um, also up there, uh, we added an extra little video um, for this week. Thank you for Dorota for um, up recording that. It's a little demo on using Singularity. So if you think that that might be useful to you, go and check it out. 
Uh, week four quizzes are going to be available later today. I will send out uh, the week four informational email uh, this evening. Uh, the week four quiz is going to be available as usual for the enrolled students on the Canvas page and for the observer students on the Google form that will be linked in the email and will be up in the materials page um, later on today. Also for enrolled students, just quick announcement, be on the lookout for an email from us. We also are going to post this into the Slack at some point early next week, uh, announcing the rollout of our Jupyter Hub, which is the cloud-based computational environment that we're going to use for project week and that you can also use for upcoming uh, data exercises to do the computations for that on the cloud. Um, so you won't actually have to download any ABCD data to your own computers. Um, and uh, again, we're sending out all that information in weekly emails. So if you're not getting those emails, uh, one, make sure you're registered for the course. <laughs> That's important. If, you're, if you are um, and you're still not getting those emails, check your spam folder, it might be going there. And if you still can't find it in your spam folder, then send us an email at info at abcd-repronym.org so we can troubleshoot and make sure that you get those. Um, Last announcement from me, uh, today is the last day to fill out the doodle poll for that student led journal club that I mentioned last week. So if you're interested in doing that, go over to the Neurostars and take a look at the posts and it should be up on there. And that's all the announcements I have for today. I guess I will turn the mic over to you guys so we can start going through some of the questions that the students had. Okay, James, right. go for it. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll get started with some of the ABCD questions. So Hugh, we're gonna put you on the spot. Uh, the first question, I'm just gonna read the first one in the Q&A here. Uh, were there any efforts placed towards recruiting non-US citizen youth into the ABCD sample? For example, immigrant, refugee, undocumented, and um, asylee, I don't know if I pronounced that right, uh, youth. If there were no specific efforts placed towards such recruitment, is there any chance of representation of these groups in the ABCD study. Uh, was citizenship an inclusion exclusion factor? Good questions. And uh, I'm going to start off by being less than impressive by saying I, uh, I don't have good information to hand on this. I did uh, just quickly there, I saw the question. So I shot an email to my uh, grad students and postdocs. They're the ones who make me look good. They're the ones who know stuff uh, to see if they actually have the numbers. So, I mean, the, the one thing I can say is that citizenship was neither an inclusion nor an exclusion factor. So there was no uh, exclusion. You didn't have to be a US citizen, but there was no explicit attempt to ensure that we had a certain uh, you know, representation or a certain number of non-citizens. Um, I won't reiterate what's in the lecture, but as, you, as most of you know, the recruitment was done through the school system. So if there were non-citizens in the classroom, then they were as invited as anybody else. And, um, and you know, <clears throat> certainly in some of our sites, like in San Diego, there would probably be, you know, a large representation from Central or, or, or South America. All our materials were available in Spanish. So um, I just don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I will actually try to track it down in the next half an hour if I can. Uh, I would suspect as the question was asked, is there any chance representation? I'm sure there is. I don't doubt it. I just don't know, but uh, but if I can find it out, I will. And, and as Hugh mentioned, this is likely uh, something that varies from site to site. So for example, in Miami, we are largely an immigrant population. And so uh, my expectation is the vast majority of participants um, enrolled from the Miami site are either first gen or second gen immigrants from uh, the Caribbean, from Central and South America, um, from, from, you know, we have a lot of Cuban individuals, uh, individuals of Venezuelan descent. And uh, so I, I don't know the answer specifically if citizenship was a question, right? But in terms of that general um, diversity and contribution of backgrounds, uh, that I think that is reflected by uh, the, the differential that we see from site to site. Yeah, yeah I do know a quick aside is like as I know for sure that we do have non-citizens in the study because um, I recall there being some issue about 
you know, certain founders haven't report social security numbers and whether or not, you know, how we might ask that question, if we should ask that question, because I know some families- But we did. didn't ask about being undocumented. I mean, that, that right. could be a fairly dangerous question. So that's exactly. not something that we, we, we specifically did not ask for that reason. Correct, yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, moving right along here, I'll uh, speak the next question. There was a slight skew in age for the sample. Was there any skew in age by gender? What about uh, pubertal status? Just curious regarding the distributions here at enrollment and whether this also differed by gender. Yeah, so I, yeah, if I recall, I believe the sample was 52% male and 48% female and 52% age nine and 48% age 10. So, you know, slight, slight skew. No idea why, no idea if it's meaningful. I don't have the cross tabs, um, but I bet I know from some of the other questions, it sounds like uh, many of you have access to the deep. So I suspect within the next 45 seconds, if somebody wants to, they could, uh, they could log on and, and uh, do these numbers for us. Um, Pubertal status, yeah. So you know, most of the kids that were, as you all know, recruited ages nine and ten. So mostly prepubescent, um, but there is variation there, and it is confounded, uh, as is the the reality. The uh, females were um, more advanced puberty than the than the males. Um, which, as an aside, if this is where the question is going, is kind of fascinating um it makes one wonder if certainly at this age range if a lot of questions that people pose as sex differences questions really are sex difference questions or if they're puberty questions or if they're pubertal by age effects that tend to differ for boys and girls um so one thing i think we would recommend if people were doing an analysis on let's say the effects of puberty or sex would be to control for the other not necessarily statistically controlled for it, but maybe look at puberty effects in the boys and then separately look at puberty effects in the girls because otherwise the confounding can be problematic. But yeah, I think it's a, it's a really interesting question. Of course, it, it's getting even more interesting now, now that the kids are coming back in, you know, they're 11, 12, 13, 14. So now they're really hitting that puberty period. And as you probably know, we are getting bio samples for them. So we'll have good quantitative measures of pubertal hormones as well as the, the self-report measures. James, before we jump over to the twins question, let's pop over to the Q&A box and sort of piggyback onto the question that's semi-related to this discussion. Uh, with regards to the ethnicity, it seems that the options are quite limited. Many ethnicities are aggregated as, quote, white. Was there a reason why this was the case, perhaps NIH protocols? And wouldn't this influence the ability to make conclusions based on accurate ethnicity? Yeah, so it's, it's in it's interesting and it's becoming ever more interesting these days now that we have you know an, an increasing sensitivity to uh, uh, race and, and ethnicity a lot of these things are historical so we wanted to design this study to reflect the demographics of the usa so as a consequence you're constrained by what is the race and ethnicity information that exists on the demographics of the usa and you want to recycle some of those same measures so that you're comparing like with like. Um, so for, yeah, the, there is more in the deep, which I believe somebody mentioned, the uh, race and ethnicity categories are quite coarse. There's only three, four, five, I think five is it. There is more detailed information in the database over, over and above that. Um, am I, sorry, am I, was there a second half to that question? Um, no, I, I, I think you're getting it. Um, I, I think one of the pieces that it's important to know is that we ask the race ethnicity question the way NIH um, asks the race ethnicity question of us so that our, our enrollment tables can be reported in a similar way. Um, I will note as sort of an aside, when Jessica and I were formulating the um, demographic questionnaire for this course, we actually, instead of going with the NIH enrollment formulation of, of you know, basically yes, no to um, Latino, not Latino, uh, Hispanic Latino, um, and then also various very coarse categories and race, um, we asked those questions the way that the 2020 US Census was framing those questions, which gives you a little bit more opportunity to indicate 
um, a, a wider range of variables, but also rather than just saying multiracial, um, to select multiple different options. Um, so we are hoping, I am hoping that the NIH is able to transition to a, a better representation about how it asks those questions in those enrollment tables, because I think that that will you know, there's this push pull between asking the question in your study versus how you report it to the NIH. And if those things are are both effective and aligned to be effective, then then that's a very good thing rather than there being two different systems where everybody asks things differently and and then yeah. how you report it is also different. Yeah, I mean, it is. I don't know if this is where the, the questioner wants to go with this, but, you know, we can. Uh, this is a really interesting issue now uh, when it comes to the data analysis. I think as many of you know that, you know, race is, you know, is included as a default uh, covariate in the analyses. And uh, if you run many analyses, you will see that it explains a substantial amount of the variance. And of course, um, everyone I talk to in our consortium, we don't think of this as, you know, as the race variable just capturing, you know, genetic or biological differences. This, of course, is a very complicated measure that captures all sorts of social and, you know, environmental and learned experiences differences. But there's a discussion to be had as to how one should treat that variable and what one should say about it. And uh, there's the obvious potential for, you know, uh, uh, individuals with nefarious intent might use or misuse that variable. But actually, there's also um, just how we need to be super duper cautious and how we report it. And I, I appreciate I'm going off a bit of a tangent, but, but, but why not? Um, for example, just to flag something that came up four or five days ago, the APS sends out, you know, kind of newsletters every week about interesting, you know, research studies, things, blog posts. One that came out last week had the fantastic title of um, how income and race negatively impact children's brains. And that's how they worded the title, how income and race negatively impact children's brains. And if you follow the link, it's all very appropriate. In fact, it doesn't talk about race at all. It talks about environmental disadvantage and how this might impact on the developing uh, kids. But a title like that, which I, you know, I think was just um, thoughtlessly prepared. Um, is exactly the wrong sort of thing that we once said uh, about how to capture this. So there's actually, an, there's a group now that has developed within ABCD that is trying to tackle this head on. How should we talk about these matters? What is best practices? How should one interpret uh, the, these variables that clearly capture a substantial amount of the variance? So this is a super important topic that we are trying to address. And timely as well. Can I ask one additional clarifying thing there? Back in the PING study, the Pediatric Imaging, Neurocognition, and Genetics, um, they also generated from the genetic information this genetic ancestry factor. So in addition to what you know, subjects answer about their you know, race and ethnicity and things like that, there are some genetic factoring that can be done. Do you have anything to say about the pros and cons of sort of the genetic-based you know, race yeah. stuff as opposed to... Yeah, I think this has also been been mooted, and I think this makes perfect sense. So again, in the deep, which is you know kind of the public face of ABCD data analysis, if you want to put it that way, you know it's these you know kind of coarse race uh, categories that are included, and for some analyses that might be appropriate if you want to have a kind of catch-all variable that you know that captures a lot of these social and environmental and learned experiences, then maybe that's appropriate. If your focus is on race per se, in terms of you know underlying biology or, or you know uh, um, you know genetics, then maybe having you know the ancestral components are the first number of principal components from the the genetic analysis might be more appropriate, and in fact might be more appropriate in many regards, in that they're not necessarily then they don't bring the baggage with them of race, because as you all know, how we even define race is very very vague, um, but you know, for, so for many purposes, for many analysis, maybe we shouldn't even be using these coarse race categories, uh, depending on what our independent and independent variables are. Maybe, maybe the, you know, the multidimensional scaling or the, 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 the first number of principal components from the genetic analysis might be more, more appropriate. Thanks. Okay, we'll turn it back to you, James, and maybe want to jump over to a reprint question just to change things up. Shake it up, give Hugh a break. Sounds good. Let's go down to uh, 
All right, so this one's a good container question. So to Dorota, is there a limit to what should be containerized? Or put another way, are there diminishing returns if you use containers in one way or another? I mean, I think like many people would say that, you know, you can containerize like pretty much everything. Um, probably that this is not my approach. Like, so, you know, like if, if it, you know, it's not like I'm doing every single thing on my laptop using, using containers, yeah? I'm not using like, for example, Zoom in the containers, yeah? But I could, yeah? So um, I personally think like, you know, for many like everyday things, you, you know, you don't have to use containers, but I think once you are like working on your research, once you are working on your publications and you really wanna be sure that you can reproduce things, yeah, you should pretty much like put everything in the container. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. in terms of like using, uh, you, you have some freedom, like, you know, where to put the software, you, where to put your data, yeah, so, you know, some of the things um, might be inside the containers. So uh, other things might be uh, outside the containers, but also has like clear way of of getting this in the later uh, point of time. So, yeah, thank you. Um, and then here's another related question of containers: How are containers used in practice over the course of an entire study? Does one have one container for each pipeline step, e.g. E pre-processing, statistical analysis, or a larger container that contains all of the software needed to re reproduce the whole study? I think like people use both, both ways of doing research. I think many people would argue that um, the second, uh, I don't remember, was it the first or second idea that you, you have like smaller containers for every single step it might be sometimes better because like, um, you know, maybe for not every single step, but you know, like if you are using one software, one package in for one step, the completely different software for second step, it might be actually easier to use two different containers. Um, also like it could be, uh, you, you could have situation that you actually cannot put this, like both things in one container. Yeah, but also like this kind of situation. So. And I think like having like a smaller uh, containers definitely can be like good thing in terms of managing these containers, yeah. I'll just echo and say that I agree uh, to say that keeping containers small is nice and what other projects have done is already provide a container for you. So if you can just then connect those uh, containers in a workflow instead of trying to put it all under the same container. I think that makes it uh, easier for you as the researcher. Thank you. And yeah, here's one that's also related. Um, what is the best way to preserve my coding environment for reproducibility, for reproducibility, but also be as interactive as possible? When working with data, people often use R or Python environments they can interact with and dynamically change. Um, it seems like a container would make the interactivity more difficult. This is kind of like interesting question. And also like, um, I might not be guessing exactly the, um, you know, uh, what author had in mind, but um, you, you know, like I understand that like many people like when, doing research, they wanna interact, for example, with data. They wanna experiment and they wanna use like very dynamic environments. But you know, like, so I think this part of the your research by, um, by kind of definition doesn't have to be completely reproducible like in 10 years, yeah? So you, you should be free to explore your things and, you know, I think uh, it's almost impossible to really like, uh, you know, track every single thing you are doing in your life on your computer, yeah? So I think this is completely fine to, you know, um, have some more dynamic, you know, um, environment and explore your data. I think it is more, once you are deciding or like using some, you know, use like, uh, 
your pipe, uh, pipeline that you want to publish your research, that's the place where you really should think about reproducibility. Yeah. So, you know, it, like on the technical side, like you can create dynamical environment within the container itself as well. Um, but sure, if you are not, uh, if you are not um, creating provenance for like things that you are doing in this container, that will not be reproducible as well. Yeah. So I think from the technical point of view, you can create, you know, you can have like, I don't know, Jupyter Notebook uh, or iStudio inside container and you can explore your data. Um, but also like, you know, like if we think about the reproducibility, we don't necessarily think about like, you know, every single, uh, you know, thing you do with data when you're like, when you are like in the, the first step of your, like you're exploring. I don't know if they would have like some um, extra thought about this, but um, you know, we, we like wanna enforce your producibility of your research, of your publication. And that, that's, I think we, we should focus on it. Yeah, that, and I think it also goes back to that last uh, question as well as the, in the in the container is that you know the ultimate thing we really am trying to correct is you know the reproducibility of the published literature. So yes, explore under whatever environments you want, but when you have you know, wandered the garden path and have selected you know the thing you know that you're going to then then publish, that's where we really need to get the particular container, the particular scripts you know uh, monitored. Moving to last week's, you know, lectures on the Git and things like that is, you know, even that garden path, you know, sometimes, you know, can be enhanced. Your ability to traverse that path and try things can be, uh, you know, assisted even in the, you know, sort of exploring mode using some of the, uh, the version control materials. But from the container, from the publication, from the software execution point of view, uh, yeah, explore, but then lock in what uh, you finally are, have decided on for, for publication. The one other, you know, uh, trickiness here is, you know, this is very hard on things that are interactive. So if, you know, your processing is, you know, run free surfer and go and correct, you know, by hand, you know, a bunch of things, you know, that correction step is very hard to monitor. But, you know, capturing the result of that correction under version control and rerunning, you know, whatever you do in that processing under version control and container, you know, can at least put all the execution, non-human parts of that you know, under control. So also like, you know, maybe some people, you know, think about like, as they, they were saying, like, you know, manually, like doing some of the steps, but also like in terms of like um, dynamic, like exploration, I might think that, you know, you want to actually uh, try different software, yeah, try different versions. And actually this is the point where containers can help you. Yeah. So because you can create like multiple different like um, you know containers with different software, and you can explore data using different different software, and without using container, sure you can install like things on your laptop, but probably we, you you wouldn't do it, yeah, because you would be afraid of like you know like uh, having like too many like uh, things on your laptop and maybe like there are some weird interactions. So actually, if you think about like uh, some exploration using different software, Docker is actually the way that can help you. So it's, it really depends what you mean by, you know, exploring which set. But... Yeah. Thank you. I think I can take one interpretation uh, of that question to mean um, is what's reproducible enough because what I see through working through uh, Docker containers, you can have it if you're running, say, there's a, a project called Rocker that you can spin up an RStudio instance, and then you can just run that through your browser. And let's say you want to install certain packages for your R analysis. So you can type in package install uh, within the running container. Uh, but as soon as you close out of that container, depending on what settings you choose, you can either uh, save that container so that the installation is preserved, or you can make it so that the uh, that the container is wiped away, and that when you start it up the image again, you start with uh, our studio with nothing installed, uh, so that you have that reproducibility of the this same image does the same thing. So if I want to change the image um, to represent like my exploration. 
would I want to just keep track of what things I'm installing and then put that in a Docker file at some point? Or is it sufficient just to save the container as uh, an image and then push that to say Docker Hub, if without explicitly creating a Docker file to uh, go along with my exploration? You know, I, I think like uh, it's completely fine, for example, to have your container, uh, your Docker image and has some additional like um, maybe script that is stunning extra thing if you want, yeah? And, you know, in terms of like uh, tracking, uh, tracking what you are doing inside container, I think uh, you will have like more lectures on this uh, because this is uh, more like touching the, the things about like tracking the provenance, yeah? Because like one thing is to provide you the environment that you can reproduce. The other thing is like tracking what you are doing in your research, yeah? And the, the, the thing that you said is like kind of on both sides, yeah? It's related to environment, but it's actually like the, the, the fact that like, okay, you know, you have to also track what you are doing within this environment, yeah? So, and you know, they might be like different different ways, yeah? If you if you can put everything in one, one script, you know, maybe the lecture from previous week, like, using Git is enough, yeah? But if you are, if you have like multiple steps, um, you know, maybe more careful like provenance techniques will be, will be required. And many of the tools that you are using uh, also have some uh, like um, help for provenance. So, and I believe that we've been like next, uh, next, uh, next, um, in, in during the spring session that we, you will have more about provenance. I'm not completely sure when, but. That's coming up later this session yeah. with Dave Keeter and Miriam Martone. And my other little nuance to that is, again, the container is better than, than nothing, since at least that's something you can give to somebody. The Docker file adds sort of some provenance of the container. So that's more introspectable and searchable and, you know, can, you know, help, you know, discover containers of certain types if the Docker files and the creation files, you know, uh, you know go with them, even though the end file is the same your ability to search and introspect them you know, is improved by including the Docker build file, the Docker file itself. Thank you. Um, and then kind of related to that provenance question, uh, Docker is going to begin enforcing rate limits on container polls for anonymous and free users. And I think in addition to that, they uh, will be deleting images from Docker Hub uh, if they haven't been pulled within six months. So is that going to change how Repronym uh, suggests how one should use containers for their workflows? So, uh, you know, it, it's kind of new, so I don't know exactly how it will work, but one thing, you know, definitely, so just to be clear, this is, this is about Docker Hub, not Docker, yeah? So, you know, you don't have to necessarily use uh, you can. You don't have to necessarily uh, use Docker Hub to uh, to keep your Docker images. So definitely, this will be an issue if you know they will be removing um, images after six months. Yeah. So scientists will have to find a, another place to keep these images because yeah, if we you don't have image, you are not able to reproduce the uh, reproduce the environment. Yeah. As for like uh, limits, I was just checking um, that I think it's like more for like, you know, some automatic work because I think the limit is like a couple hundreds per like six hours. So um, for like one level is for uh, not uh, for, uh, for um, not register users, the other is for free users. So um, yeah, there are different limits, but you know, definitely Docker Hub is not the only place where you can keep your Docker image. So, um, and yeah, we have to address this issue for sure. When I asked that question also, oops, uh, when someone asked that question uh, internally to the, to the Reprenim emailing list, uh, Yarek chimed in that the continuous integration stuff, which I don't know if we'll get into in this course, but uh, can be pretty hard on Docker pulls since there may be issues there when you try to get your software to self-assess itself as you develop things. Uh, and the second thing that got mentioned is, you know, of course, a, the shameless plug for Reprenim creating a container store. Uh, and when that was first uh, mentioned, you know, a couple of years ago, it's like, oh, how do you know Docker Hub will always be there? 
it's like, oh no, who's, what's more stable, a, a, a grant, you know, to ReaperNim or, you know, something like Docker Hub? Well, apparently ReaperNim in some sense, you know, may be a more stable place. And then the Nitrix and other places of the world, yeah. you know, yeah. be, become opportunities to take yeah. up that, that I think, support. I think it's also like important to like, actually remember about this, that, you know, both like it's similar to the discussion about like, for example, GitHub, yeah? Sure, we, we cannot be sure that GitHub will be in five years, but it doesn't mean that like what you are doing will disappear, yeah? Um, GitHub is based on Git and there are like many places that you can put your code and still be using Git. And even without Git, you will still have a copy of your, of your software. So um, we are using these tools, but I think like it's also like important to remember that we're trying to use tools that we are not like, you know, we do not depend on like one, one, uh, one uh, software company. Yeah. So, and like Reponium will provide some extra, like we can also provide some extra places where you can put. Thank you. I think that we should switch back over to ABCD. Uh, there's a couple of questions left for Reponim, but there's uh, a good number of questions left for AB, ABCD still. Um, <clears throat> so we'll pick up where the last question for ABCD, where uh, the question is, how do you write a limit filter to separate monozygotic and dizygotic twins in an analysis? I believe that rel underscore relationship twins will give me twin data, but I'm not sure how to code for zygosity. Um, so it sounds like a deep question. Yeah, <clears throat> it's interesting. Uh, I mean, there's a there's the hard way, um, you know. So the genetic information is now available, so you can you know estimate, you can calculate the genetic similarity, and then I you know separate the dizygotic from the monozygotic twins using it. At one point, I know we had. A, because there was, a, you know, there were some delays in releasing the genetic data. We had a shorter panel. It was like, you know, about a hundred SNPs that I think were chosen for being, you know, good to separate uh, uh, to identify the twin chips. But there was some issue with it as well. And I also remember at one point we had a questionnaire uh, that was kind of a, a sanity check. I think it, it went with the what was the name like peas in a pod or something. Uh, they were just asked about physical characteristics. I don't know, there's, again, you know, there's an open chat here, uh, people who work on the deep. I don't know if there is a variable that identifies. I was going to ask, did we, did we even ask that question? Because scientifically, there are certain cases for monozygotic twins that split so early that you can't detect that they're monozygotic. So a lot of parents don't even know. Um, I'm a monozygotic twin mom, by the way. And um, there's there's just uh, the chorionic sac, uh, the amniotic sac, all of these things develop at different stages. Um, and if it splits very, very late, um, then they are potentially conjoined twins. Um, I have monoamniotic monozygotic twins, which means that we were really close to being conjoined. Um, and so there was no membrane separating those twins. Long story short, um, in the cases of the monozygotic twins that split very, very soon after conception, they have separate placenta, they have uh, completely separate environments, and you can't really distinguish those from dizygotic. So even if we were to ask that question, we wouldn't necessarily get the correct answer from everybody. Yeah, and that's why I think that that piece in the pod questionnaire was kind of a sanity check, but it was never, it was never anticipated that it would be, it would be definitive. Um, of course, you know, and not to go off on a complete tangent, but, you know, parentage isn't even definitive. You find out all sorts of interesting things when you have people's uh, genetics information. Um, but yes, yeah, so I think the ultimate test was always anticipated that it would be an, an analysis on the, of the genetics. And I know a lot of people have been doing these types of analyses already, um, you know, looking at, you know, genetic similarities for GCTA type of analyses. But I don't know if anybody has then fed that back and said, okay, here's our determination of mono versus die as a kind of easy to access variable for people. That would be an excellent yeah. use of Enda's data collection, the, the study where you you feed back your results and, and people could be able to access that information where the genetic analysis has been done and there's a binary code then for mono versus die. That would be a really good good use of what Enda anticipated as being the purpose of that study field. Yeah, absolutely. And sorry, just as an aside, yeah. uh, 
again, my intelligence actually isn't my own because I don't have much, but my students do. So uh, I saw that question advanced when I shot a, a, a question to one of my postdocs and she just responded saying, there's a text file. Oh boy, I won't even bother reading it out, but it has a, it says there's a variable that codes kids as being monozygotic, dizygotic, siblings are not available. Um, so there is a specific- And it's in deep or it's in one of the official releases? Uh, probably in one of the releases. Um, the text file I have here, if, if, anybody, if anyone is taking notes at home, you know, ACSPSW03.text. But if you're in the deep, if you, you know, as everybody knows, there's a search function in there. So if you, you know, just search for zygosity, it should come, it should come up. So it looks like somebody has done what you were saying, Angie, where they've, you know, done the coding. And then again, I don't know if it was done by the data analysis core or by, you know, the separate person, I'm guessing the data analysis core. And so we may follow up with an email from you. We're trying to make sure that these um, questions get answered in, into the yep. Google Doc and, and Christina's typing, but I don't think she got that file name. So we'll email you and we'll make sure we get that and then it goes into the document. And Perfect. Dave, did you want to say something? I was just going to use that as a jumping off place as a general reminder that in general, uh, the NDA wants us to put results back, you know, especially things that are common so that not everyone has to redo those things. And again, that was a perfect example and you already picked that up, but I wanted to say that more generally that if any of the analysis we do, we're supposed to be teaching and conveying to, you know, the folks in this course that the results should come back into NDA as a data release, it gets credit, it gets protected, it gets, you know, accessible, but also addable without, you know, regenerating, reinventing yep. wheels, you know, over and over, which we do all the time in sort of when we don't share that. Yep. And this is not just a, we would like this. This is actually part of the terms and conditions of the doc that you signed. So we'll be talking more about that as we move forward. Um, and this is also a good opportunity next week to maybe talk specifically with the end of folks about that, if you have questions about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, next question I see is related to the lecture. Um, I believe that Hughes said that ABCD expected a 10% attrition over the course of the entire study. Uh, where did your expectations of attrition come from? When designing the recruitment and retention strategy, did you have other long-term longitudinal studies to refer to for guidance? Yeah, so the 10% estimate was a complete lie to convince the NIH to give us the money. No, that's not true. Um, and it, it was actually based in our consortium. There are a number of people, especially for some reason, it comes to mind a lot of the twin studies who that have followed cohorts uh, that have done longitudinal studies of a decade and longer. And when we did a review of those studies, the aggregate was about a 10% uh, attrition rate, which I have to say, we all found, I personally found very ambitious and I thought was very optimistic. Um, but interestingly, you know, uh, I, I think you know this from the lecture, we're, you know, just what, we're less than one and a half percent attrition thus far, and we are a few years in. Now we're well aware that the real challenge is coming down the pike because the kids are still, you know, young and probably, you know, a, a retention is primarily driven by parents and caregivers. As, under their parents' control still. I didn't want to phrase it like that, but that's exactly the right way to think about it. Uh, so certainly when they turn into, you know, uh, the uh, dreaded teens and, and their Lord have autonomy of sorts, um, then we're expecting that it could get um, much more challenging. So this is a, a, this is the big threat. This is the ongoing stressor that we have. How are we going to keep these kids in the samples? Because of course now we have this cool baseline data we really, really, really want to know what happens to them when they hit age, you know, 19 and 20 in terms of mental health and cognitive abilities and good stuff and bad stuff. So, you know, there's an active working group that monitors this. We, um, well, one small aside, again, I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but there was always the anticipation that we would transition to more, you know, mobile assessments, you know, just requiring less effort uh, to get into the testing center. The whole COVID challenge has fast tracked this for us. Um, and, you know, I think we've learned a lot of lessons and uh, I think this is to our benefit so that, you know, we can, because, you know, if, if it's easy and, you know, people are being reimbursed for their time, they'll stay in the study. It's if it's challenging, if there's just logistic hassles of coming in, then they won't. So, um, so this is, this is our goal to try to make this less and less cumbersome as, as we go on. But the 10% anyway, to come all the way back to the original question. Yes, it was based on other long, uh, long-term longitudinal studies. And it was the, an estimate from them. 
All right, awesome, thank you. Uh, next question is moving more into analysis. Um, so as you showed in your talk, there are quite a lot of demographic variables one can either stratify by or include as regressors in an analysis. Do you have any thoughts on accounting for important factors while also watching out for overfitting the data by including too many? Oh, good question. And you've already had Wes Thompson present in the course, right? Um, so this is, I think this is a really, really interesting question. As I'm sure Wes was, uh, was mentioning in his talk, the take home message from ABCD from large samples is that true effects are small effects. I'm sure you, this has been said out loud. Um, and in fact, uh, um, a postdoc of mine, Max Owens, is just about, has just submitted a paper where he, he even he stayed away from the neuroimaging data, but he looked at thousands of correlations between all the behavioral and neurocognitive measures. And you know the median correlation across these, and just these very simple pairwise correlations is you know drum roll. The median is 0.03 correlation. Uh, and if you say, well, if you want to keep the statistically significant ones, or if you include covariates, or if you look at this factor, that factor, it doesn't change much. And like, you know, the 90th percentile is still, correlation is still less than 0.1. So these effects are small. So to come back to the question, then, if you start willy-nilly including covariates, you are not going to, uh, it's not going to be hard to make those effects go away. So... I think, and this is not a very satisfactory answer, but I don't know if anybody has got anything more intelligent to say on the matter. You have to be super judicious in your inclusion of covariates. Uh, you can't just include a whole bunch of things by default. The only things you might want to include by default might be scanner, you know, if you're looking at a brain measure. That's the sort of thing that maybe you have to include. But you really have to be thoughtful that about the covariates you include. And I think best practices at the moment seems to be emerging is you might report your results with and without covariates. And you might even do it in a staggered way. You might say, here's our primary effect. Now, if we include the sort of covariates that are not controversial, let's just say scanner, here's the effect. Now, if you include covariates that might in fact be related meaningfully to the independent variable of interest, here's the effect. And maybe there might be no option but to give that full suite of results and then in your discussion thoughtfully talk about why you should or should not include this variable or that variable and how you should interpret the results. This is not an easy question. If any of the others have anything to say about it, this is a really big challenge that we are, we are confronting. I think I might add there that this is also maybe a good opportunity to pre-register your hypotheses because seeing as there are so many different variables that you could include, um, it's kind of ripe for p-hacking and we want to avoid that obviously. So I think that um, just being thoughtful about it and making sure that you're clear about what you plan to do before you actually do it is important in this context. Yeah, and another comment and it's actually alluded to in the, in the questioner's question, you know, one might, and we kind of used this earlier, one might consider, well, do I want to covary or do I just want to stratify? Maybe I don't want to just covary away the effects of sex. Maybe again, I want to look separately at boys and girls. So again, that's another type of decision one could make. And with a large sample size, you now perhaps have the luxury to do that, which is great. If no one else has anything to add, then I can move on to the next question. The next question appears to be a follow-up from maybe the, the previous question that you answered. Uh, have there been considerations for when participants move away from home? Uh, what if they are in an area and they are, are where there are no ABCD sites? Right. Yeah, so there are. We have a whole protocol and a procedure for this. So if a family moves away, then yes, in an ideal situation, they move close to another ABCD site and then we literally transfer them. Um, but what we're also doing now is um, because these kids are so valuable, you know, we will uh, uh, pay their cost to come back, especially for the biennial MR visit. So we will talk with the family and we will find out what their preference is. And in many times they're delighted because they say, wait, I can come back and visit my family, you know, every couple of years on your dime. And we say, absolutely. Because I mean, you know, it seems expensive, but if you think about it, the amount of time and effort and resources put into each one of these kids and the cost of the assessments and the imaging and the sunken costs already, 
you know, shelling out a thousand dollars to bring, you know, a caregiver and the kid back is actually worth it in the long run. So yeah, we do have a protocol in place for this. Thank you. I think I'll do one more ABCD question and then we'll see what's left for the referendum questions and get some of the, then maybe head back to ABCD if we have time. So uh, one more that I'd like to ask is another question about deep. Uh, so a question about neuroimaging variables in deep. How can we see the design files and any other information used to create these variables? So it's provenance about some of the neuroimaging variables in deep. So the neuroimaging, so the design files, so the, it, it, help me out. Are we talking about the design files in the GLM that was run for, let's say, the task fMRI data? Is, is that what this is referring to by design files? Let's interpret it that way. And then if we're wrong, hopefully we'll follow up with the questioner. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, they're available. I'm just trying to think where they're available. They're, they've got to be available in the ABCD release notes, what the actual design files were for the GLMs. Does anybody know where they are for sure? I know the protocols are on the website. Did we put the, did we put the design? files on the website as well on like the main study website hmm. i don't know uh, i don't believe or well, maybe it is so you know there is a a scary long paper by don uh, hagler in dcn or was it neuro, neuro image describing the whole imaging processing pipelines it's one of those worthy go-to papers that you'll never just sit down for fun and read. Um, but it has a lot of the information uh, in it. I don't know if the design file information is specified in it or not. Why don't we take this on? If it's not somewhere easily accessible, then I think this would be a worthwhile thing for us to, uh, for us to make available somehow. So thank you for the question. Yeah, and uh, this is also something we can follow up on. All the answers are being typed on the Q&A um, Google Doc, so um, we can follow up on this later too. Great. All right, and with that, we'll switch back to Repronym uh, for a couple more questions. So uh, one question, first question I have here is, when do we get to start using Data Lab? So we do have a data led lecture coming up. Um, Adina Wagner will be presenting on data led to us. Um, I guess I will also say, you know, we've, we've built this course to progressively move through reprinim tools and we are here to provide a guided tour of those to you. So we don't want to stop you from doing additional pre exploration. So this, when do we get to start is uh, you are welcome to right now, please. Uh, Adina has some amazing tutorials online to help explain how data lab works. And I actually think that kind of digging into that now will better prepare you for her lecture so that you can get through that initial hurdle of trying to figure things out and then get stuck on some really deep questions that can go into the Q&A so that our, our discussion then with her can be a little bit more uh, intensive. My additional point there though is part of the beauty of data lad is how easy it makes things compared to alternatives and so part of our staggering of staging of things is to send you through the painful ways so that you understand and appreciate and therefore are more patient with working through the foibles and issues of something like data lad because you know what you know things are like without it and can better assess for yourself the pros and cons of data lad and we have accused Yarek of going in and adding that question because he but anyway all right uh thank you is there anything anybody else want to add uh, I was just going to comment, sorry. Uh, the one thing is that you can use that rad very, very easily to retrieve data. Uh, and that's, you know, that's that's the step that you should really, you know, uh, it's a pleasure to go and grab an open your data set using that rad because it's so, uh, it's, it's, it's so easy to do. Uh, and, uh, and, and then the, the question is, you know, how, you know, what is your use case for it? Uh, and if you want to make sure that that data set is uh, is kept on the control version somehow, I think that's that, that's to me the primary use case that you may you may want to have. Uh, yeah. Does 
a quick note on this. All right, thank you. Um, that was JB Pauline jumping in there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then one more question on the reprintm side. What is the best way of finding the right slash stable version of Docker Singularity as well as the image of the software library to use? So it, it, uh, what the right and stable, that was the question? Yeah, so I think one in question, the first part of the question is saying like, what version of Docker should I use or what version of Singularity should I use? And then the oh, second okay. sub question is, how do I find what's the correct version of the images of those respective platforms that I should use? So, you know, like I think we, we often say that um, just try to use the newest version, you know, so uh, in terms of like Docker, um, I think this is like pretty stable um, software. So um, if for like singularity, because it's a newer software, you might have like have like different like it's bigger differences between version but i think we always recommend to use you know the newest one because like there are like many software developers that are working on these two technologies and they're like you know they're paid for like fixing things so hopefully like you know uh if you are using the old one that it might be stable but maybe it's not like you know uh, the new version is uh has some features that you, you might like so uh in terms of software um you know, um, we, I think like many, many different uh, software, like uh, tool developers, they always try to provide, um, you know, image with uh, like specified version. So, you know, you often you have like, a, you are using this so-called tag. So it, it might be later, but uh, well-maintained uh, packages, we always have the version. So uh, for example, if you go to, FMI prep, you will have like different versions of for, for software. Again, um, you know, uh, you might have reason to use the, uh, you know, the version from like 2019, but you know, we are often recommend using the, the latest things. And um, yeah, it's, um, you know, stable doesn't mean that it was the, is the best always, yeah? So even if something is stable, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be trying to use the newer version. I'm not completely sure if that was the question, but the full, it was the best answer. Yeah, I did. thank you. Yeah, that was a good answer. I think I would uh, just add that for when you're trying to create a research project and when you're publishing something, I like to avoid the, the latest tag for images. Because if I run it today, latest is going to refer to something different like two years from now. So if I want to have the exact same code being ran on this image, uh, then I would want to have, hopefully there's like a tag that's associated that's not latest. Definitely, uh, like if you are like using, um, you know, pre-run uh, pre images, pre-created images, uh, be sure that you are aware of the tags that were used and yeah, yes, avoid using latest. I think many, many developers actually avoid even like uh, publishing the tag with latest because it's it might be very, um, it's not very meaningful. Which is a little bit of an effort because it's the default when you type in uh, pull command. So just be aware that you have to manually specify tags. I think that would be my, my overall suggestion. OK. So I think we have time for maybe a couple more short questions. I'll switch over to uh, ABCD again. Uh, this one appears to be a confirmation question. Do we know how many participants will have year two measurement data in the 3.0 release? Thought I saw the number 5,937 in the PowerPoint, but wanted to make sure. Uh, good timing. I was just typing a response to that uh, while, while you were talking. I don't know for sure, but that number sounds about correct because the full sample has what eleven thousand eight hundred and eighty or seventy eight, but uh, there were you know slightly more recruited in year two than in year one, so that would sound good. Release three point zero was supposed to be any day now. I think I heard it might have been pushed back another week or so. Um, so you know if 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 you can wait, we'll know the exact number within within a week or two when once the the release happens. 
All right, thank you. Do you want to tackle one more question or do you think that's about time? I think we, we're, oh, sorry. I was did gonna say it would to... be a hard stop by uh, yeah. the officials. So it'd probably be hard to start one. Yeah, so let's okay. go ahead and take a moment and thank you, James, for moderating those questions. We really appreciate that. Um, thank you, Dorota. Thank you, Hugh, for joining us this week. Um, for providing your lectures and, and for being here to answer the questions. We really like giving the opportunity for students to have that one-on-one -on -one, um, to get their questions answered and, and to you know see a little bit of the faces of the folks who are contributing to ABCD and contributing to Reaper NIM. Um, so with that, thank you all for being here and we will see you next week, same time, next time for 90 minutes, not 60 minutes. And anyone whose question didn't get answered, keep at us via the mechanisms we are here to answer questions somehow. Yep. Thanks, everybody.